The following is a message from the pulpit of the Bible Baptist Church of Tuscaloosa, Alabama, led by Pastor Philip Blackwell. It is our desire that God would use this message to be a help and a blessing to you. If you're looking for a traditional church where Christ is preeminent and the membership is family, we invite you to come and be our guest. Now may God bless you as you listen. Go ahead and find in your Bibles the Gospel of John, chapter number 5. The Gospel of John, uh, chapter number 5. We are going through the Gospel of John on Wednesday night. Uh, We are calling it the Gospel of Glory. And it's in the Gospel of John that we see the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God uh, in all His glory. And so here we're in John chapter number 5. Last week we began uh, the lesson, but we didn't get past the first point. Uh, But I believe tonight we're going to try to get through the rest of John chapter number 5 this evening. Well, if you found your place, let's stand out of love and respect for the Word of God. And uh, we're not going to read all the verses all the way down through verse 47, uh, but I do want to read just a couple of verses here in John chapter 5 to get us... uh, Uh, Just to get us familiar with the text again, then I'll make a few of the introductory remarks and we'll get right into the lesson uh, tonight. The Gospel of John chapter number 5 and verse number 16. It says, And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. But Jesus answered them, My father worketh hitherto and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because not only had he broken the Sabbath, but said that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. Notice there in verse number 17, Jesus calls God my Father. And then in verse number 18, the Jews were mad at him, uh, because he said also that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. And so tonight we're going to continue our thought on the Son of God. It's in this portion of Scripture that Jesus proves beyond any shadow of a doubt that he is who he said he was. So let's pray tonight. Lord, we sure love you, and we are thankful tonight that we get to gather together in church, and Lord, we get to read your word. And Father, I'm thankful tonight that as we uh, read your word, we can trust everything that is contained therein, for it's not the word of man, but it is the very word of God. And so, Lord, I pray tonight... (laughs) that as we try to preach the Word of God, as we try to, Lord, give that which you have given to us, God, I pray that we'd be a help, and God, we'd be a blessing to every person that's in this room. Lord, my desire is not just to have a Wednesday night Bible study just for the sake to say we've been in church on a Wednesday night. God, I desire that you might meet with us. Lord, I'm so thankful for the uh, prayer time. I'm so thankful for the singing and everything else that we've done this far. But Lord, I pray that as we begin to enter into this most important time of the service, Lord, that your spirit would work in this place. And Lord, that we'd hear what you're trying to tell us through the scriptures. Lord, I know tonight that each person that's here is uh, probably tired. They probably have had a very busy day. But God, they're in church on a Wednesday night because they wanted to hear from you. And Lord, Tonight I pray that this would not be a fruitless time, but God, I pray it would be a very fruitful time as we look into your word. Now God, I pray you'd fill me with your spirit. God, I pray you'd give me your words. And God, I pray you'd help me to say that, which would be good to the use of edifying tonight. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated this evening. Before we can begin to actually deal with the several verses and the several thoughts of our text concerning Jesus being the Son of God, there's a few things that we need to understand uh, here in our text. Number one, in verse 16, we find the persecution of Jesus. What you find in verse number 16 is that the Jews, the Bible says, persecute Jesus there in verse 16 and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. What was the thing that was done on the Sabbath day that had these people in such an uproar about? Well, it was the healing of that man who needed to be made whole that was at the pool of Bethesda Uh, and what we find here uh, in this portion of scripture is that Jesus had the audacity to heal this man on the Sabbath day which they believed uh, broke the law of God but we know it did not for Jesus said that um, Sabbath was made for man and not man for Sabbath absolutely when you look in the Bible even in the Old Testament
Testament, if the ox got in the ditch, they could get down and get the ox out of a ditch. And if you can think about it this way, if you can pull an ox up out of the ditch on a Sabbath, how much more can someone be healed by God on the Sabbath day and it should not be a problem? They had more compassion on their animals than they did on people and that is a great error and we find that even in our day today. And so here we find Jesus was being persecuted because uh, he uh, healed this man on the Sabbath. And then in verse 17, we see the proclamation by Jesus. Jesus is going to proclaim that God was his Father. And the Bible says there in verse 17, but Jesus answered them, uh, My Father worketh hitherto I work. And so we find there is Jesus is making God uh, His Father, or He's stating that God is His Father. And because of this, we find the problem with Jesus in verse 18. Yes, they were upset because He had healed on the Sabbath day, but they were much more upset because now he had made himself equal with God by saying that he was the Son of God because God was his Father. And the Bible says there in verse 18 that the Jews sought the more to kill him because not only had he broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his Father. Now what you're going to find in this text, look down at verse number 19, is Jesus is going to answer these people. The Bible says, then answered Jesus. And so the people were doubting him who he said he was, that he was the Son of God. And they were even wanting to kill him. And in verse number 19, Jesus is going to begin to answer them and to clearly identify himself as the Son of God. Well, last week we looked at verses 17 through 23 and we saw his unequaled association with the Father. We saw how that Jesus and the Father uh, had a special relationship. In verses 17 through 19, we saw the Father's labor with the Son. We saw because the Father worked, Jesus entered into that same work uh, with His Father. Not only the Father's labor with His Son, but next we saw the Father's love for His Son. In verse number 20, the Bible says, For the Father loveth the Son. And so we're talking about the relationship between God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ. And we find that this is an unequal association in that when Jesus works, it was God the Father that was working. And we see here that Jesus was also the object of the, of the love of the Father. And then in verses 21 through 23... We find that Jesus speaks of the Father's loyalty uh, to the Son. Matter of fact, if you look there in verse 23, the Bible says that all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son honoreth not the Father which has sent him. And so what we find there is Jesus is saying this, you honor me just like you honor God the Father. You know why Jesus could say that? You know why Jesus could put himself on an equal footing with God the Father? It's because he was God the Son. And we talked about that. We'll not get into all those different details like we did last week. But what we do find is this, is that if you're going to honor the Father, then you've got to honor the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is God manifest in the flesh. So number one, we saw his proof of being the Son of God by his unequaled association with the Father. But number two, look in verses 21 through 30, and we find his unprecedented, unprecedented uh, responsibilities. Look in verse number 21 and notice that Jesus is about to say that I do things that nobody else can do. I am put on a level that nobody else has put on. God the Father has given me a responsibility that he's given to no one else. And you're going to see what he, how he words things here, how that Jesus is claiming that as the Son, God has given him great power and authority. Look down in verse number 21. Jesus shows his responsibility as the one who quickens or the one who makes alive. Look in verse number 21. The Bible says, For as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth or maketh alive 
whom he will. And so notice the Bible says this. Not only does the Father have power to raise the dead, but the Bible says here that Jesus himself has that same power as God the Father. Hey, it should not surprise us that Jesus is able to do that, which God the Father can do, for he is God manifest in the flesh. The Bible says that in Christ uh, dwelt the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And so we find here that uh, Jesus Christ is doing the works of the Father and he has the same power as the Father uh, to even raise the dead. Look at verse 25. The Bible says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live. So here Jesus is saying is there's going to come an hour when the dead's going to hear his voice. Not the voice of the Father, but the voice of the Son. And when they hear the voice of the Son, they're going to be made alive. You're going to find in the scripture that Jesus could raise the dead. You'll remember the widow that had that son that was dead, that was passing by. Jesus walked up to the pier and he told that boy to arise. And what happened? That boy got up. What about last? Lazarus at the tomb, we find Jesus goes there uh, to that tomb and he simply says, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus got up after he'd been dead four days. He got up from the dead and he walked out of that tomb still bound in his grave clothes. See, Jesus said this. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He didn't say, he didn't say, God the Father gave me that. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Hey, in Jesus is life. I want you to understand understand friend tonight that Jesus has the power of life and death and one day after the tribulation one day after the millennial reigns over Jesus is going to speak and all the dead's going to rise in that day we who are saved now we're going to hear a voice and we're going to go up to meet the Lord in the air at any moment that can happen at any moment but the context of the scripture here is dealing with uh, dealing with that resurrection at the end. And what we find is that they're going to hear the voice of the Son. Now look down at verse 26. It says, For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. Now jump down to verse 28. It says, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice. Jesus is going to speak, and there's going to be a great resurrection. Man, that's going to be a time. Those that uh, at the end of that, at the end of all things, when that uh, last resurrection takes place, hey, they're going to hear the voice of the Son of God. And you know the Jews understood exactly what he was talking about here. He was talking about that day when he's going to judge all men. And listen, that takes us right into the next point. Not only does Jesus have the unprecedented responsibility of quickening the dead, but he's also he also has the uh, unprecedented responsibility of judging all men. Look at verse 22. The Bible says, For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. You know what? If you were to ask a Jew living in this, in this early uh, first century... If you would have asked them, who has the power to judge, they would talk about God as being judge. But you know what Jesus does here? He puts himself on the same footing with God the Father. And here's what he says. He says, the Father that judgeth no man but the Son, uh, but hath committed all judgment to the Son. So the Son is going to be that judge. He is going to be the one that men shall stand before. Look at verse 27. The Bible says, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is, notice the capital, son of a man. So we find Jesus has the ability to judge men. Look at verse number 28. And the Bible says, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in which uh, all that are in the grave shall hear his voice, and shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of a damnation. So what you find here in verse number 30, he says this, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. Hey, you know, here's the problem. Jesus was saying this one day, you're judging me now saying that what I'm saying is not true, but one day I'm going to stand in judgment of you. Have you ever heard someone make this statement, God's my judge? And they say it almost with a, almost as if uh, they're thumbing their nose at righteousness in the Bible. Have you ever heard someone say that? 
God's my judge. You know what? That is true, but it's going to be Jesus Christ, and that ought to scare you to death. Hey, a man being your judge shouldn't scare you because that man has no power. But if you know Jesus Christ is your judge, that ought to put the fear of God in your heart, knowing because Jesus knows everything about us. And what he was saying here is that I'm going to be the one that is going to judge. I'm the one that's going to stand or sit on that judgment seat. I'm the one that's going to pronounce a guilty verdict. And so we find him as the one who judges. But I want you to see this. Jump down to verse 24. Not only is, does Jesus have the unprecedented responsibility of quickening people or giving them life and the unprecedented responsibility of judging all men, but listen, Jesus also has been given the unprecedented responsibility of saving the lost. Look at verse 24. The Bible says this, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from uh, death unto life. You know what that verse is talking about? It's talking about the power of Jesus to save. Hey, Jesus came and Jesus spoke his word. And he's saying anybody that believeth my word, uh, they're going to pass from death unto life. They're going to be given eternal life. You know, oftentimes religion uh, teaches men that if they're good enough, they'll get to go to heaven. That's not what Jesus says. Jesus simply says, believe on him that sent me and you'll have everlasting life and not come into condemnation. But then at that moment you believe, you're passed from death unto life. Do you understand that before a person is uh, saved, they're dead men walking? Their spirit, the Bible says, is dead on the inside. And you know what? The Bible teaches also that they're under condemnation, waiting judgment. The Bible talks about being condemned already because they had not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. So they're condemned already. They're dead men walking, awaiting their execution. But here's the wonderful thing. If men will believe in Christ, if they'll hear God's word and they'll believe on Jesus Christ, at that moment they'll go from condemnation to clemency. They'll go from a place of eternal death, that's where they were going, to the lake of fire, to a place of everlasting life. They're passed from death to life. They've been given a spiritual resurrection. Read Romans chapter 6. It talks about that. Hey, how we've passed from death unto life. And that's because of Jesus Christ. Hey, Jesus has the ability to quicken all men. All men will stand before Jesus as judge. But listen, if people will fall before Christ and they'll receive Him as Savior, hey, they'll find an unprecedented responsibility in the one who has the ability to save whosoever will. And let me pause and say this. I'm thankful that Jesus says that whosoever will may come. I'm thankful that he tells us that he that heareth my word, he, that's the only qualifier on this thing. He doesn't say that God has chosen some for heaven and some for hell. He just simply says, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. And friend, that is God's qualifier. It's not about church attendance. That doesn't get you to heaven. It's not about trying to be good and living a a good life, though all Christians ought to do that after salvation. It's about coming to Christ and trusting in Him who's able to save our soul. Matter of fact, the Bible says that He's able to save to the uttermost those that come to God by Him. Hey, friend, that's the Savior we have. Now, you've got to understand, when Jesus was preaching this message He was preaching it to a bunch of religious people that were trying to rely on their works to get them to heaven. They were trying to be good enough to please God. And you know what Jesus just did uh, in verses 21 through 30? He basically tells them, you're not good enough. Your religion's not going to get you to heaven. Hey, the only thing that will get you to heaven is coming through me. Friend, I'm going to tell you, the first few points probably made these religious folks mad, but the second point really began to get them upset. Because now Jesus had the audacity to say that you don't have to go down to the temple. You don't have to offer up sacrifices. You don't have to uh, do all these religious works. Hey, you just believe on me. 
So we see his unprecedented responsibilities. But number three, notice, not only does his unequaled association prove him to be the Son of God, number two, his unprecedented responsibilities prove him to be the Son of God, but number three, notice his unparalleled witnesses prove that he was the Son of God. Now, what you'll notice in verses 31 and 32 is that Jesus is not wanting people to believe him according to the witness of his own mouth. Proverbs 20 and verse 6 says this, Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. See, it's easy for us to praise ourselves, but you know what? That's not where the witness comes from. Any man can praise his own self and talk about his own goodness, but listen, it does not matter. The Bible says if we commend ourselves, what matters is if God commends us. And so what we're going to find in these verses is that uh, Jesus is going to give four witnesses. He's going to call four witnesses to the witness stand, and they're going to speak and witness and testify that he is the Son of God. Now, who are these witnesses? Well, number one, he calls John the Baptist the forerunner uh, to the witness stand. Look in verse number 32, or actually 31. It says, I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. If I bear witness of my... um, Let me read that again. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another that beareth witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesseth of me is true. Ye sent unto John, and he bear witness unto the truth. And the Bible says in verse 34, And I receive not the testimony from man, but these things I say that ye might be saved. He was a burning and a shining light, and ye were willing for a season to rejoice in his life. So he calls John the Baptist to the witness stand, and he's saying that John the Baptist witnessed that he was the Son of God. Matter of fact, he tells the people in verse 35, that for a season they rejoiced in the light or the witness or the testimony of John the Baptist. But friend, there was a day that John the Baptist proclaimed that Jesus was the Son of God. Go to John chapter number 1. We looked at this earlier, but go to John chapter number 1. John was that forerunner. He was going to be the one that was going to testify that Christ had come. And we find that John is going to witness that Jesus is uh, the Son of God. Take your Bible, please, and let's jump down all the way down to verse number 29. John 1, verse 29, it says, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, this is he of whom I said, After me cometh the man which is preferred before me, for he was before me, and I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest unto Israel. Therefore I am come baptizing with water. And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove and in a boat on him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, upon uh, 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 the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. Look at verse 34. And I saw and bare record, that this was the Son of God. And so he says, I called John the Baptist to the witness stand. John the Baptist there on that, uh, in that Jordan, by that Jordan River, he sees Jesus Christ and he proclaims that Jesus is the Son of God. There's a second witness, and that's the witness of his miracles. Look down at verse number 36. He says, but I have a greater witness than that of John. Wow, a greater witness than John the Baptist? Even Herod uh, revered John the Baptist. But notice he says, I have a greater witness than that of John. For the works which my Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me, that the Father hath sent me. You know what he's saying? The works that I do bear witness that God is my Father. What was his works? Well, we just saw in John chapter 5 how he healed a man there. And we'll see many more miracles that Jesus will do as we continue going throughout the gospel of John. He turned water into wine, you remember that. And many other things he's already done to this point in his ministry. And here's what he's saying. He's saying all the miracles that I perform testify to the fact that I am the Son of God. 
And that's exactly what his miracles did. They testified of who he was. Look in John chapter number 10. You're already there, so go to John 10. And look what the Bible says here in John 10 and verse number 25. He's going to say the same things that he's saying here in John 5. John 10 and verse 25. Jump back to verse number 24. John 10 verse 24. This was after another healing that he had done. He had made a man who was blind. He gave him the ability to see. And look in verse 24. It says, Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and ye believed not. Everybody's always looking for a sign, but here's the fact. Even when a sign comes, they still don't believe. They had never seen anyone do what Jesus has done. Open the eyes of the blind, make a man who couldn't walk, give him the ability to walk. Up to this point, he's already raised some from the dead. They've never seen anyone do the things that Jesus had done, yet they're still asking for more signs. And you know the truth is this. That's what the world's looking for, for a sign. But if they got a sign, they still wouldn't believe. It's the hardness of hearts. And so Jesus, the, the Jews said, Thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. And verse 25, Jesus answered, said, I told you, and ye believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But ye believe not, because ye are not my sheep, and as I said unto you. And what he's basically saying is here, you don't have a heart where you want to believe. See, the thing that stops men from coming to Christ It's not the fact that Jesus isn't the Son of God. It's a hardness of heart, and it's an unwillingness to come to Christ. That's the problem. See, men think that they're good enough. Man thinks that he can do enough to please God. And man thinks that if his good outweighs his bad, then he'll get to go to heaven. But that's not Jesus' plan. Jesus says, you've got to come unto me that you might have eternal life. And the miracles only testified that he was who he said he was. Go to John 15, look at verse 24. John 15 and verse 24. John 15 and verse 24. Look back at verse 23. Well, there's so many verses here in John 15 that we could read, but let's just jump back to verse number 23. It says, He that hateth me hateth my father also. You know, you remember Jesus said, If, if you, you honor me like you honor the father. Did you see that in John 5 where we were just at? And Jesus saying this, If you hate me, you hate my father also. So he's putting himself on the same footing with God. Now look at verse 24. He says, If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, They had not had sin, but now have they both seen and hated both me and the Father. Boy, what a stern statement. The wickedness of men's heart. Instead of seeing the works that Jesus did and believing on him as the Son, they had a hard heart. And they got to the place where they hated Jesus Christ. You know, that's how the world feels toward Jesus Christ today. You think about it. You can talk about any other religion that you want. You can talk about any other God that you want. But the moment you mention the name Jesus Christ, have the audacity to pray in His name, hey, I'm going to tell you, that's when the sparks begin to fly. It's interesting to me that in Congress, people uh, people are all right with people testifying about Allah. But when somebody prays in Jesus' name, everybody has a fit. It's amazing to me. You know why? Because the other gods are not gods. And whenever someone says the name Jesus, it convicts the hearts of sinful men. Because they understand on the inside that one day they will stand before God and stand before Jesus Christ His Son and they will give an account. So we see His unparalleled witnesses, the witness of the forerunner, the witnesses of the miracles. And then we find the third witness uh, Jesus calls to the witness stand and that's the witness of the Father. Look down at verse number 37. Now, I don't want you to miss these two verses because you can have no greater testimony than God the Father speaking on your behalf. Yet that's exactly what's happened. Look what the Bible says here in verse 37. And the Father himself which hath sent me hath borne witness of me. So now Jesus is saying, My Father has already borne witness of who I am. 
It says in verse 37, Ye have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his shape, and ye have not heard his word, uh, not his word abiding in you for whom he hath sent. Ye, uh, him ye believe not. And so notice, what are the witnesses are the witness of the Father? Well, I wrote this, or I actually copied this. A friend of mine, James Raspberry, wrote this about these verses. And I'm going to read it to you because he wrote it better than I could say it. All right, so I want to read it to you. Dr. James Raspberry wrote this concerning these verses. He said, When did the Father testify concerning Jesus? Well, he sent his angelic messages before the conception of John the Baptist concerning the Messiah's appearance. So before John was born, there was a witness that Messiah was coming. He sent an angelic messenger to Mary before her conception. Did he not? That she was going to be the mother, uh, uh, that she was going to be the mother of the Savior of the world, stating that her son would be the Son of God in the Christ. He spoke to Joseph in a dream concerning his son. Here's what's interesting to me as well. Not one time in the Bible do you find the Bible saying that Joseph is the father of Jesus Christ. You'll find where men suppose the Bible says that Joseph was his, was his father, but you don't find one reference in the Bible to Joseph being the father of Jesus. You know why? Because he wasn't the father of Jesus. God the Father was. Notice he sent his angelic messengers at the birth of Jesus who announced that Christ, the Son of God, was born. He directed wise men from the east who declared that Christ was born. He spoke directly on Christ's behalf, behalf twice at his baptism and at his transfiguration. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Hey, God the Father out of heaven spoke. And people that were around heard him speak. He gave witness that Jesus is the Son of God. So you've got the witness of the forerunner. You've got the witness of miracles. You've got the witness of the Father. But last, you've got the witness of the Scriptures. And this is the greatest witness of them all. Look what the Bible says in verse 39, please. Jesus says this, Search the Scriptures. You know what he's talking about there? The New Testament hadn't been written. He's talking about the Old Testament Scriptures. He's talking about Genesis all the way to Malachi. He says, search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life. He's saying you're trusting in the Old Testament. You're looking at those and you're thinking that you have eternal life. But notice what he goes on to say. And they are they which testify of me. So he's saying that the word of God in the Old Testament testifies of him. So here's the fact of the matter. The scriptures gave witness of Jesus Christ from Genesis to Revelation. I believe that in just about every book of the Old Testament, you can find a picture of Jesus Christ somewhere in that. Whether it's in the sacrificial offerings, uh, whether it's in types like Boaz, other things. Hey, you'll find Jesus Christ throughout the pages of the Old Testament. Look in John chapter 24. This was after the resurrection in John 24. Well, Luke 24, I'm sorry, not John John doesn't have 24 chapters, does it? All right, Luke 24. Luke 24, you'll find after the resurrection, Jesus is going to use the Scriptures to prove His resurrection. What Scriptures? We'll see. Luke 24, look at verse 25. These disciples were discouraged on the, Emmaus, on the road to Emmaus because Jesus had died. Look at verse 25. It says, Then said he unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and, enter, and to enter into his glory? And beginning in Moses. What is that? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That's the first part of your Bible. Beginning in Moses and all the prophets. That's both the major and the minor prophets. So it went from Moses all the way to the prophets. That even covers the historical books. He expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself, and they drew nigh unto the village uh, whither they went, and he made as though he would go, have gone farther. And so what we find here is that Jesus testifies through the scripture that he is who he said that he was. You know, people are saying, well, if I had a sign preacher, I would believe. You know, there's a man in the Bible that wanted a sign for his family. He was talking to Abraham. He was burning in a place called hell, and he was talking to Abraham. 
And he said, Father Abraham, send Lazarus that he, may, uh, that he may go and testify unto my brethren. That's what he said. And you know what was repeated back to him? They have Moses and the prophets. You know what they were saying? He was saying that they've got the word of God and that's all they need. And he even goes on to say they'll not be persuaded though one would rise from the dead. You know what? Somebody did rise from the dead. A man by the name of Lazarus. You remember Lazarus? Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. Remember, Jesus was seated at the table with Lazarus. And what did those people want to do? Now, not only did they want to kill Jesus, but now they also wanted to kill Lazarus. Because he was a living testimony that Jesus was the Son of God and that Jesus had the power over death, hell, and the grave. And so what we find is simply this. Men simply should believe the Scripture. For in the Scriptures, we have all that we need to come to Jesus Christ. See, Jesus is the Son of God. He was the Son of God, and He is the Son of God, and He is God the Son. And one day each of us will stand before Him, and I hope tonight that your heart is right with God. Let's stand together. Lord, we love you, and uh, we thank you for these folks that are here on this Wednesday evening. And Lord, I would pray that as I tried to preach on the outside, I pray that you would have preached on the inside. Thank you for listening to this message today. It is our prayer that this sermon fed your soul, lifted your spirit, and encouraged you in your walk with God. And as we conclude, please remember, there's always a place for you at Bible Baptist Church.